Hello and welcome to lesson 17 of 20 in the URSA campus breakdown course on introductory statistics and probability. This is module four, introduction to inferential statistics, part three, hypothesis testing concerning sample means and proportions for a single population. Let's get started. The preceding lessons in this module gave us a detailed look at how sample data can be used to generate point and interval estimates for population means and proportions for a single population and with respect to the comparison of two populations. In this lesson, we take a further step into inferential statistics by examining how sample data can be used to make decisions about claims related to population means and proportions. The topics covered in this lesson include claims about population parameters, fundamentals of hypothesis testing, hypothesis tests about population means, and hypothesis tests about population proportions. Much of the work of statistics is in addressing claims that are made about populations. Examples of such claims are myriad, but here are some typical ones. For example, the Chamber of Commerce of a certain city reports that the average house price there is $350,000. Or a drug company reports that their new medicine used against a particular disease has a side effect occurrence rate of less than 5%. Or, questions from reporters prompt a logging company official to claim that a forest area has trees with an average age of at least 50 years. In the preceding lessons of this module, we have discussed how obtaining sample data can shed light on such claims. With confidence intervals in particular, we are able to comment on the likely veracity of such claims. What is necessary for us at this point, however, is to establish a formal and robust means for testing these sorts of claims using statistical principles so that important decisions can be made about the populations that concern us based upon the data we are able to collect from them. The system we will use is called hypothesis testing and we will now proceed to examine this process in detail. In the context of statistics, a hypothesis is a proposition made about a population and is typically based upon a claim about that population, such as those described previously. A hypothesis test is a procedure that applies statistical analysis to make a determination of whether or not the hypothesis, and therefore any claims associated with it, are supported or not by sample data collected. While uncertainty prevails in the absence of accurate and complete census data, always the case when we are limited to sampling only, decisions do have to be made on a regular basis in the so-called real world. Hypothesis testing, therefore, is relied upon as a means for making important decisions in situations of incomplete access to population data. Examples of significant decisions that can hinge upon the results of a hypothesis test include the following, whether or not to approve the public release of a new drug, which of several similar companies should receive limited investment funding, or whether or not a forest area meets the criteria to be open to logging. We now outline the overall process that comprises a hypothesis test. While there are various kinds of hypothesis tests, depending on the population parameter of interest and the number of populations involved, all hypothesis tests generally proceed according to the overall sequence of steps outlined as follows. In step one, we identify the claim that is to be tested. This is the purpose of the hypothesis test, a claim of some sort that is being made about a population or populations. In step two, based on the claim, we determine what are called the null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis. And the short form we use for, for those are H naught for the null hypothesis and HA for the alternative hypothesis. 
H naught and H A are mutually exclusive. In other words, if one is true, then the other is false and vice versa. H naught always includes an equal sign, either by itself, if it's a two-tailed test, or as part of a greater than or equal to sign for a one-tailed left test, or a less than or equal to sign for a one-tailed right test. HA, on the other hand, can either include the not equal to sign for a two-tailed test, or else the less than sign for a left-tailed test, or the greater than sign for a right-tailed test. Since the claim in question may or may not include an equal sign, it can be aligned with either H0 or HA. Now, there are three possible general sets of hypotheses that result, and they're shown on the slide below using the example of a test about a sample mean mu, where mu naught is equal to some hypothesized constant value. So the first one you see on the left is the, is the two-tailed test, and you see the two hypotheses are shown as follows. H naught is the hypothesis that mu is equal to mu naught, and then HA, therefore, by, by default, it is the hypothesis that mu is not equal to mu naught. So you see how H naught and HA sort of fit together, and they're a comprehensive and, um, and mutually exclusive and, and therefore an exhaustive set of hypotheses. So either H naught or HA would be the actual truth. The one-tailed test work as follows. In the, in the remaining two sets of hypotheses, we see in the next one, the one-tailed uh, left-tailed test works as follows. Um, it, one way of, of reading this is we can start with HA, and you can see why it's a left-tailed test, where, where the, the HA is the hypothesis that mu is less than mu naught, and so therefore, H naught is the hypothesis that mu is greater or equal to mu naught. And the one-tailed uh, right-tailed test is just the exact opposite or mirror image of the left-tailed test. And you can see that uh, if we start with HA, we HA is the hypothesis that mu is greater than mu naught. So H naught is the hypothesis that mu is less than or equal to mu naught. H naught is presumed to be true in other words, it's the default hypothesis. And this is upheld by the test unless the data provides sufficient evidence to reject it in favor of HA. In step three, we select a level of significance or LOS, which equals alpha, as discussed in the previous lessons. Recall that alpha equals one minus the LOC. So for 90% for 90 confidence, alpha equals 0 0.10. For 95% confidence, alpha equals 0 0.05. And for 99% confidence, alpha equals 0 0.01. Note that alpha must be selected before any sample data is collected. And the reason for this is because it's our selection of alpha, in other words, our selection of level of confidence that determines where our goalpost or goalposts are located against which the sample data results are compared. In step four, we identify the relevant test statistic. Now, there are numerous possible ones depending on the type of claim and test. In this course, we use Z, T, F, and chi-squared tests. And for the purpose of outlining this procedure, we'll, we'll just use the example of a t-test. And note that the test statistic that's used has to be the same one used for the corresponding, for any corresponding confidence interval for the same parameter. In step five, we formulate what's called the decision rule. This is based on alpha and the degrees of, degree, degrees of freedom where relevant. Now, in, in the tests used in this course, it, Z is the only one that doesn't use degrees of freedom. The others do, uh, including the F test, which we'll see later, uses two separate degrees of freedom. And we also base 
the decision rule on whether the test is two-tailed or one-tailed. Next, we determine the critical value, which is usually written uh, as the test statistic with a subscript C, like we see TC here. Finally, we determine the decision rule. And this is, for this, a diagram is useful for showing, for a diagram is useful for showing this. And that's illustrated generally below for the specific example of a hypothesis test about a population mean. And these are, the diagrams below show t-tests. So we see bell-shaped t-curves. And we can see that starting with the two-tail test, the the two-tailed test uses both, uh, has two goalposts, that uh, plus and minus TC. And the area from minus TC to TC inclusive is called the do not reject HO region. Meanwhile, the the two tails, uh, one to the left of minus TC and the other to the right of uh, TC, are the reject HO regions. And notice that the areas of each tail are alpha over two because there's two tails. The one tail tests, both left and right, have only one, have only, in the case of a left tail test, there's only the minus TC, and in the case of a right tail test, there's only the plus TC. For the left tail test, the do not reject region goes from minus TC and it, to the right, inclusive of minus TC, and the reject re HO region is everything to the left of minus TC, and the opposite is true for the right tail test. We have everything from TC to the left inclusive of TC is the do not reject HO region and everything to the right of TC is the reject HO region. And we also see that for the one tail tests, of course, the area of the single tail equals alpha. In step six, we go ahead and conduct the sampling and then calculate what's called the obtained value of the test statistic. And we'll go over the details of the formulas for each, uh, for each, for the obtained value of the test statistic for each different uh, type of test statistic, and for every different type of test as well. In step seven, we compare the obtained value of the test statistic with the decision rule, and we either reject HO or or do not reject HO as as is written in the diagrams. And it's a note here. Uh, Statisticians, generally speaking, do not like to use the term except for any hypothesis. Therefore, the term do not reject is used instead of saying except. However, do not reject HO can generally be taken to mean that HO is supported by the sample data, while reject HO means that it is HA that is supported instead. The diagram above shows the regions in which the obtained value of the test statistic can fall in comparison to the plus, plus and or minus TC, plus and or minus the critical value as previously discussed, and then the corresponding decision made about HO as we've also discussed on the previous slide. And finally, the one last step that's important, step eight, state the final conclusion in the context of the problem. In other words, answer what the decision about HO made in step seven says about the original claim. And this final conclusion statement should be something that can be appreciated by someone who understands and cares about the context of the problem, but may not necessarily be, be a, a student or expert of uh, in, in, in statistics. The method of hypothesis testing provides a useful means of making concrete yes or no decisions about claims in real world situations. It's important to remember, however, that these decisions are made based upon sample data from populations, which in the absence of a complete census is subject to the uncertainty inherent in any random sampling process. In other words, 
Hypothesis testing allows us to make decisions using a logical and robust framework, but the decisions we make are still subject to the risk that they are the wrong decisions. While we cannot eliminate such risks entirely, we should be able to recognize and understand these risks. We endeavor to do so here by looking at all of the outcomes that are possible when conducting such a test. When testing a null hypothesis H0, there are four possible outcomes based upon, first of all, whether the true state of nature is that H0 is true or is not true, and secondly, whether we make a decision based on the sample data to reject H0 or to not reject H0. These are shown below in the slide in what is called a decision matrix, and you can see the table at the bottom of the slide shows the two possible states of nature down the left side, H0 is true, H0 is true or H0 is false, and then the, the two possible decisions that we can make based on the sample data, which is either to not reject H0 or to reject H0. The decision matrix is based upon the premise that we are always, so to speak, in the dark about the true state of nature. In other words, whether or not H0 is actually true or false. Since we are required to make an educated guess, our ultimate decision can either be correct or incorrect. So no matter what we decide, it's either going to be a correct decision or not. As the matrix above shows, two of the four possible outcomes are that we make a correct decision. And those ones you can see that have got the green check marks. Either we, and the first possible, the first possible correct decision is that H naught is true and we don't reject it, right? So if H naught happens to be true, we, we, we don't want to reject it. We want to essentially accept it. Or the other kind of correct decision is if H naught is false, we then end up rejecting it, which again is a good decision because if H naught is false, we want to reject it. These are the decisions that we hope to make when we conduct hypothesis tests. Then there are the two other possible outcomes from any hypothesis test, which represent incorrect decisions. So either the first type of incorrect decision is when we reject H0 when in fact it's true. Imagine H0 is actually true, but we go ahead and reject it. We call this a type one error. It's also sometimes called, we refer to as a false rejection. Or the other type of incorrect decision is to not reject H0 when it is false and should be rejected. So in other words, H0 is false, but we go ahead and fail to reject it. This is called a type two error, also otherwise known as a missed rejection. We now turn our attention to defining the probabilities of these errors. The probability of a type one error is the probability that we reject H0 when it is true. This is actually represented by alpha, which is the level of significance that we've discussed previously. When we select a value for alpha before collecting sample data for a hypothesis test, we are actually setting our level of acceptable risk of a type one error as the above formula shows. The general diagram for hypothesis tests is shown again below in the slide, and it illustrates that type one error occurs at the tails. The curves reflect the distributions, and, and you can see in the diagrams for the two tail, for the one tail test, all of, the, all of alpha is located in the one tail, whether it's a left or right tail. Whereas if it's a two-tailed test, we see that we split the total value of alpha into alpha over two as the area of each individual tail. Now the curves reflect the distributions of the sample parameter under the assumption that H0 is true. That's really important. So these diagrams assume that H0 is true. 
If H0 is indeed true, then the likelihood of obtaining a random sample result extreme enough to call for a rejection of H0 equals the shaded area or areas of the tail or tails, which equals the pre-selected value of alpha that we choose before we collect our sample data. The probability of type 2 error is the, is the probability that we do not reject H0 when it is false, and we call this beta. Now, type 1 error is based upon the assumption that H0 is true, as we previously discussed. So it is possible to draw a single bell-shaped curve to represent the situation, as was shown in the previous slide. In the case of type 2, to error, however, the premise is that H0 is false, which means that the true value of the population parameter could be any, num any number of other values, anything other than the value, the hypothesized value for the parameter. This can be illustrated in the case of a hypothesis test about a population mean mu, where the hypothesized value is mu0. If H0 is false, then the true curve is shifted from the hypothesized one, as the diagram below shows for the case where mu is greater than mu0. In other words, the true curve would be shifted somewhere to the right from the originally hypothesized curve. From the diagram, we can deduce that beta decreases if the magnitude of mu minus mu0 increases. In other words, as the hypothesized population mean deviates further from the true population mean, the likelihood of a missed rejection of H0 diminishes. This implies that the probability of a type 2 error depends upon the extent to which H0 is false. It can also be seen from the diagram that if alpha is smaller, then beta will be larger for a given true value of mu and vice versa. This means that there is an inherent trade-off between the risks of type 1 and 2 errors. We can minimize the risk of the former by choosing a smaller value for alpha, but it comes at a price of an increased risk of the latter error and vice versa. We can also define a measure called the power of a hypothesis test. And it's defined as the probability that the test will correctly reject H0 when it is false. In other words, when HA is true. Power, therefore, is equal to 1 minus beta. In example 1, a market gardener sells baskets of apples at the local market and advertises that the average weight of apples in each basket is 5 kilograms. Test this claim at a level of significance equal to 5% against a sample of five baskets with a mean weight of 4.72 kilograms and standard deviation of 0 0.16 kilogram. So to answer this question, we proceed as per the steps that were outlined previously. So in step one, we, we see that the claim being made here is that the average weight of apples in each basket is 5 kilograms, i.e. the claim is that mu equals 5 kilograms. As a general rule, and so in step two, we note that as a general rule, it can be assumed that a hypothesis test is two-tailed unless the claim is explicitly one-sided. Now, that's a really important um, point here, which is why it's included here in bold, um, that unless otherwise explicitly indicate, indicated, uh, we assume that all hypothesis tests, by default at least, are two-tailed. So here there's no such other indication, so we can assume that we are testing the claim that the average weight is 5 kilograms against the alternative claim that it is not 5 kilograms meaning either less than or greater than 5 kilograms. So this is a two-tailed test with the hypotheses as follows. H0 is that mu equals 5, and HA is that mu is not equal to 5. So in step 3, 
uh, we are told explicitly in the question that we're instructed to test this claim at level of significance equals 5%. In other words, alpha is set at 0 0.05. For step four, we recall that for confidence interval estimates for mu, we use the t distribution. For a hypothesis test about a single population mean, the general formula for the t statistic obtained from the sample data is t obtained equals x bar minus mu naught over x over s divided by root n, which works out to in brackets x bar minus mu naught times root n over s. So for this test, t obtained equals x bar minus 5 times the root of 5 over s, with x bar and s determined once the sample is conducted. In step 5, the decision rule for this test is based on the following. Alpha equals 0 0.05. The degrees of freedom equals for a single sample n minus 1 which equals 5 minus 1, which equals 4. So therefore, as this is a two-tailed test, our t critical values are plus and minus t 0 0.025, which is uh, the alpha over 2, 0 0.05 over 2, equals 0 0.025, and degrees of freedom equals 4, which, is, which to three decimal places is plus or minus 2.776. So the resulting decision rule diagram is as shown on the slide. We see the bell curve with the plus or minus t values plotted of plus or minus 2.776. The region uh, between those two values inclusive is the do not reject H naught region, and the, the two outlying tail regions are the reject H naught regions. In step six, we now go ahead and calculate t obtained based on the sample data. So we got a mean of 4.72 and a standard deviation of 0.16. So we substitute those into the equation and we get uh, rounded to four significant um, digits minus 3.913. Now, that value in, in step seven, we analyze that. So we, we see that that value for T obtained lies in the left rejection region. In other words, it's negative, so it's on the left side, and it's less than minus 2.776, which is the critical value on the left. In other words, our T obtained is less than our minus TC of minus 2.776. So therefore, based on the decision rule, we reject H naught, that mu equals five. So therefore, we can say that the sample data supports HA, which is that mu is not equal to 5. And finally, in step 8, we put this into sort of the um, real world context. So we take it out of the sort of statistical context and talk about it in terms of the actual problem at hand. So in step 8, we conclude by saying, therefore, that we reject the market gardener's claim that the average weight of apples in their baskets is 5 kilograms. Now, we can also say, based upon the sample mean of 4.72 kilograms being far enough below the hypothesized mean weight of 5 kilograms to yield a value of T obtained that is in the left rejection region, that there is significant evidence to suggest that the mean weight of apples in these baskets is less than 5 kilograms. In other words, when we're doing a two-tailed test and we reject the null hypothesis, it's it's really important to then go ahead and distinguish between whether we've rejected it on the left or lesser side or on the right or greater than side because really it's a, it's a very important distinction because they're two very opposite and extreme situations and you want to be able to include in your conclusion what it act, what's actually happening and does it mean that the that it appears that the weight of the baskets is is smaller than hypothesized which is the case here or otherwise larger than hypothesized In example two, we're asked to redo example one for alpha equals 0 0.01. So there's not very much further to do to answer this question because most of the work has already been done in example one. If the only change is in the value of alpha, then there is no change in the value of T obtained because T obtained is based on the sample data only 
and not on the test conditions, which include the value of alpha that's selected. What does change is the decision rule, because a different value of alpha means a different value for T critical. In other words, here, we're going to have TC equal to plus or minus T of 0 0.01 over 2, which is 0 0.005, and the same degrees of freedom equals 4, which gives us to three decimal places plus or minus 4.604. This results in a wider do not reject H naught region, as we can see in the diagram on this slide. Now the do not reject HO region spans from minus 4.604 to 4.604 inclusive, with the reject H naught tails on the outside. So the result that we get from the sample of T obtained equals minus 3.913 now falls within the non-rejection region in the middle. So therefore, we do not reject HO, that mu equals 5. In other words, we, we essentially accept the null hypothesis that the mean is 5. And therefore, or in other words, we accept the market gardener's claim that the average weight of apples in their baskets is 5 kilograms. The results from examples one and two are quite opposite in terms of the final decision that is made about the claim in question. And yet, the only difference between the two scenarios is that alpha has changed from 0 0.05 to 0 0.01. This illustrates the fact that the decisions we make using hypothesis testing hinge upon where we set the line, so to speak, in the form of our selection of alpha and where the sample results fall in comparison with that line. In general, when we do not reject H0, it's not because we obtain a sample mean X bar that's exactly equal to the hypothesized population mean mu0. Because remember, we expect to almost never get a sample mean that is exactly the hypothesized value. The reason, rather, why we do not reject H0 for any such deviation between the obtained and hypothesized mean is that we expect some deviation to occur due to simple random variation of data, even if in fact H0 is true. In other words, even if H0 is true, we still expect more likely than not, in fact, almost certainly, that we're going to get a value for X bar that doesn't exactly equal mu0. At some point, however, we may cross over a threshold be between deviations small enough to be due to random variation only and deviation that is so large that it is probably caused in part by a real difference between the, hypoth the hypothesized and true values for the mean. This threshold is an arbitrary one that we choose. And in fact, it's based upon our selection for alpha. In example one, we used alpha equals 0 0.05, which set the line closer to the middle than the value uh, for alpha equals 0 0.01 that we used in example two. The sample data that was obtained yielded a deviation that was beyond the threshold for alpha equals 0 0.05, which is why we rejected H0 in example one. Meanwhile, with the threshold set further away in example two, in other words, we kind of, one way of thinking of it is we widened the goalposts. The same sample data fell within the central area this time, and so we did not reject H0 in this case. In other words, 4.72 kilograms is significantly lesser than 5 kilograms when alpha equals 0 0.05, but not when alpha equals 0 0.01. The moral of the story here is this. The decisions made as a result of a hypothesis test are clear cut, as in we either reject or do not reject H0. However, this result falls around a knife edge, so to speak, in the form of our prescribed value for alpha, which ultimately determines the decision that we make based on the sample data that we obtain. Examples one and two show us how the same sample data can yield opposite decisions due only to different values of alpha. 
This raises the following question. At which value of alpha does this change in conclusion take place? To answer this, we start by looking at how t obtained falls along a sampling distribution for both one and two tail tests as shown in the diagram below. So you see there's actually three diagrams there. And what you see, uh, you, again, we have the left tail test on the left and the right tail test on the right and the two tail test in the middle. For any value of t obtained, we can define its corresponding p-value, what's called a p-value, as the probability of obtaining an equally or more extreme result, assuming that h naught is true. This is shown as blue shaded areas in the diagrams above. Note that for a one-tail test, the p-value is equal to the area of the single tail, whereas for a two-tail test, it's evenly divided into both tails so that each tail has an area of the p-value over 2. As the first set of diagrams below shows, when t obtained falls within the do not reject h naught region, the p value is greater than alpha. And you can see that by comparing the blue areas, which is the p value, uh, p values with the green areas, which are the alpha values. Meanwhile, on the other hand, when t obtained falls in one of the reject H0 regions, then the opposite is true. The p-value is less than alpha, and you can see that in those diagrams that we end up with the blue area being smaller than the red area. In other words, the p-values are smaller than the alpha values. And this can be summed up in the following very important rule for all hypothesis tests with respect to p-values. And it's as simple as this. If the p-value is less than alpha, h naught is rejected, while if the p-value is greater than or equal to alpha, h naught is not rejected. An alternative method of determining decisions in hypothesis tests involves finding the p-value that corresponds to a particular value of the obtained test statistic, and then comparing it with the value for alpha as per the rule outlined in the previous slide. When the test statistic is Z, this is a rather straightforward process, as the Z table allows us to look up a wide range of Z values rounded to two decimal places, and then the table returns us the corresponding value of phi of Z, which can then be converted accordingly to a P value, as we will see shortly in the case of hypothesis tests on proportions. And the table gives us probabilities that are rounded to four decimal places. For hypothesis tests about population means, such as in the preceding examples, however, the test statistic is t. And as we have seen previously, the t table only shows t values for a limited number of tail area probabilities. Only rarely, therefore, will our t obtained give us a direct match from the table. So, the best we can usually get from the table is a range of possible p-values that correspond to our t-obtained. In most cases, however, this is sufficient, and it certainly will be sufficient in this course, as we usually only use specific commonly used values for alpha. The following rules apply to using the t-table to obtain p-values. Values of t obtained are looked up in the table in the row for the corresponding degrees of freedom. If t obtained is negative, simply look up the positive value, as by symmetry the p-value is the same in either case. If there is a direct match for t obtained in the row, which is not likely to happen often, then look up to the number at the very top heading of the column. If it's a one-tailed test, that number is the p-value. If it's a two-tailed test, then the number times two gives you the p-value because, of course, there will be two tails, and the table here is only giving you the area of one of the tails. If t obtained falls between two numbers in the row, then for a one-tailed test, the p-value will fall between the two numbers at the top headings of these columns. 
And for a two-tailed test, the p-value will fall between the two numbers at the top of these columns, each multiplied by two. So you double the tail areas by two. If t obtained is larger than the largest value in the row, then for a one-tailed test, we can say that the p-value is less than the number at the top of this column. And for a two-tailed test, the p-value is less than the number at the top of this column times two. And then if t obtained is smaller than the smallest value in the row, then for a one-tailed test, the p-value is greater than the number at the top of this column. And for two-tailed test, the p-value is greater than the number at the top of this column times two. In example three, we use the p-value method to determine what the decision about the claim would be for example one at LOC equals 90%, 95%, and 99%. So to answer this question, again, we can say that most of the work has already been done in example one. We have T obtained is equal to minus 3.913. We know that the degrees of freedom is four. So we proceed as follows. In the degrees freedom equals four row, we can see that 3.913 falls between 3.747 and 4.604. And you can see the diagram of the extract from the table is shown in the slide on the right. So we can see that our number, we take the negative away, and so we've got 3.913, and we can see that in the row of df equals 4, that there's, there's two numbers it falls in between, 3.747 and 4.604. So we proceed as follows then. Uh, we, can, we can see that, now this is a two-tailed test. Now you can see if you look up above those two numbers, that they correspond to tail areas of 0.01, zero and point zero zero five now be, what we do is we multiply each of those by two so what we say then is that the p-value therefore is going to be between and make sure you put of course the the number in the heading on the left is larger than the one on the right so we want to switch those because if we're having our um, inequality so that the 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 signs are always pointing to the left which is sort of the the general most common convention for that we would then say, therefore, that the p-value is greater than 2 times 0 0.005, which is 0 0.01, and less than 2, ti 2 times 0 0.010, which is equal to 0 0.02. Therefore, the p-value is greater than 0 0.01 and less than 0 0.02. So we can therefore say that the p-value will be less than alpha when alpha is equal to 0 0.05 or 0 0.10. And of course, any, any larger alpha values. And the p-value will be greater than alpha equal to 0 0.01 and any smaller values of alpha. So our final conclusion then, therefore, is that we would reject H0 and the claim that mu equals 5 kilograms at levels of confidence equal to 90% and 95% and of course smaller levels of confidence. On the other hand, we would not reject H0 and therefore the claim at level of confidence equal to 99% and of course also larger levels of confidence. There is yet another method that can be used to conduct a hypothesis test in addition to the critical value and p-value methods shown thus far and that's confidence intervals. You might recognize that we've actually employed this method already in the previous lessons when asked to comment on the results of calculations of confidence intervals for population means and proportions based on obtained sample data. The basic premise involved here is that at a certain level of confidence and therefore at a certain value for alpha, the confidence interval is actually the same as the do not reject H naught region from the hypothesis test. Therefore, if mu naught is within the CI mu, using a test for a population mean as an example, then the decision will be to not reject H naught and vice versa. Note, while this link between confidence intervals and hypothesis tests is valid for both one and two-tailed tests, in this course, we will limit our examination of this to two-tailed tests 
as we have limited our coverage of confidence intervals to symmetrical ones, i.e. with two tails. Let's now reconsider the hypothesis test of examples one and two using 95% and 99% CI mu's. In example four, we test the claim from example one at LOC equals 95 and 99% by calculating the corresponding CI mu's and evaluating them. So the relevant sample data here is n equals 5, x bar equals 4.72, and s equals 0 0.16. And we recall the formula for a confidence interval for a population mean. Ci mu equals x bar plus or minus t alpha over 2 degrees freedom equals n minus 1 times s over square root of n. So substituting the values from our sample results, we get... 4.72 plus or minus t at 1 minus LOC over 2 degrees freedom equals 4 times 0.16 divided by the square root of 5. And so to figure out the, LO, the confidence intervals at 95 and 99 percent LOC, the only thing we need to know that, we, that is going to be different between those two is in substituting the level of confidence, in the first case it'll be 0.95, in the second case it'll be 0.99, and that just gives us a different t value, which respect, respectively are 2.776 and 4.604. So when we substitute those values in, we get the following results. For at 95%, we get a confidence interval that's 4.72 plus or minus 0.20 which gives us the confidence interval from 4.52 to 4.92. And then at 99%, we get a wider uh, margin of error. We get 4.72 plus or minus 0.33 instead of 0.20. And so we get that wider confidence interval that goes from 4.39 to 5.05. Now, from the results above, we would reject H0, which is that mu equals 5, at the level of confidence of 95%, in other words, when alpha is 0 0.05, because as we can see here, the CI mu, the confidence interval, does not contain mu naught equals 5. In other words, the entire confidence interval is below. Um, it consists of values below or less than 5. So we would furthermore say that there is significant evidence to suggest that mu is actually less than 5. Now, at the LOC of 99%, in other words, when alpha is 0 0.01, we see that the CI mu this time does contain mu naught equals 5. In other words, uh, the, the confidence interval uh, starts at a value lower than 5 and ends at a value higher than 5. So it contains the value of 5, the hypothesized value of mu naught equals 5. So we would not reject H naught, which is that mu equals 5. In other words, there is insufficient evidence here to suggest that mu is not equal to 5. And even though we got a sample mean 4.72 that was less than 5, it wasn't, I guess, I suppose a good way of, of reiterating this is to say, in other words, that while we got a, a, a sample mean less than 5, it wasn't enough less than 5 for us to reject the null hypothesis that mu equals 5. In example 5, a rival Apple vendor to the one from example 1 claims that their baskets contain an average weight of more than 5 kilograms of apples. A sample of 10 baskets is obtained with a mean weight of apples of 5.06 kilograms and standard deviation of 0 0.22 kilograms. So in part A, we're to test the vendor's claim at alpha equals 0 0.10 using the critical value method. And then in part B, we're to test the claim using the p-value method. And finally, in part C, based on your answer from part B, explain what the conclusion would be at each of the alpha values 0 0.001, 0 0.005, 0 0.01, 0 0.05, and 0 0.10. So to answer this question, we proceed as per the steps outlined previously. So in step one, the claim being made here is that the average weight of apples in each basket is more than five kilograms. Now that's a directional claim. In other words, the claim is that mu is greater than five kilograms. So in step two, we see that in this case, the claim being made is, is directional. So this is a one tail test. 
and it's a right tail test because of the greater than sign in the claim. The hypotheses are therefore as follows. Remember that the null hypothesis H naught has to include the equal sign. So we start with H A, which is the claim that uh, mu is greater than five because there's no equal sign included in that. We would put that into the H A spot. So in this particular problem, our claim corresponds to H A, not H naught. So H A is that mu is greater than five. That would therefore mean by default that H naught would be the opposite of that, which is that mu is less than or equal to five. Step three, we're instructed to test this claim at alpha equals 0 0.10, so that's our alpha. Step four, the test statistic is x bar minus five times root 10 divided by s. Step five, the decision rule for this test is based on the following. We have alpha equals 0 0.10, degrees freedom equals 10 minus one equals nine. Therefore, for a one tail right tail test, we get T critical equals the positive T for 0 0.10 and nine, which rounds to 1.383. The resulting decision rule diagram is shown on this slide. We have the bell curve and we plot our T critical of 1.383. Any T obtained to the right of that, we will reject H naught. Otherwise, we will not reject H naught. So step six, we now bring in our sample data and calculate T obtained, which equals 5.06 minus five times root 10 over 0.22, which rounds to 0 0.862. In step seven, we see that our T obtained falls into the do not reject H naught region. Therefore, we do not reject HO that mu is less than or equal to five. And finally, step eight, therefore we reject the apple vendors claim that the average weight of apples in their baskets is more than five kilograms. In B, we proceed from the calculation of T obtained equals 0 0.862. So we look it up in the table basically. So we look in the DF equals nine row and we can see that the value of 0.862 for t falls below the smallest value of t in that row, which is 0 0.883. And what that means, therefore, is that our p-value here must be greater than 0 0.20. So using the p-value method, then at alpha equals 0 0.10, we would not, since, since our p-value is greater than alpha, point i.e., um, we, have, we don't know exactly what the p-value is, but we know it's greater than 0.2, and that must be, of course, greater than 0.1. Any, any number that's greater than 0.2 is definitely greater than our alpha equals 0.1. So therefore, we do not reject H0, and therefore reject the claim that mu is greater than 5 kilograms, which is our HA. In part C, since the p-value is greater than 0.20, the same conclusion to not reject H naught and therefore to reject the claim that mu is greater than five kilograms would also be made at all of the uh, alpha values of 0 0.001, 0 0.005, 0 0.01, 0 0.05, and 0 0.10. In other words, because we know that our p-value is definitely greater than 0 0.20, that value is greater than all of the alpha values that were asked to um, evaluate for in, in part C. So we would make the same conclusion to not reject H naught and therefore to reject um, the claim which represents H A. Example six. In the previous example, the claim was made that the average weight of apples in each basket was over five kilograms. What would the result of the hypothesis test be if the sample mean was 4.94 kilograms instead of 5.06 kilograms, with everything else staying the same. So to answer this, we start by noting that, as before, this is a one-tailed, right-tailed test, and the decision rule is the same because we have the same alpha equals 0 0.10 and the same sample size of 10. 
What does change here is the value of t obtained due to the different sample mean. So we calculate t obtained, it equals 4.94 minus 5 times root 10 over 0.22, and we get minus 0 0.862. This happens to be the same t obtained from the previous example, except minus, because 4.94 is equally distant below 5, then 5.06 is above 5. This leads us via the decision rule to a decision not to reject H0 and to accordingly reject the claim. Now, this conclusion, in fact, does not require any calculation like this at all, because as this is a right tail test, it's only possible to reject H0 if we get a value of T obtained far enough to the right of zero, resulting from a sample mean exceeding mu naught equals five by a significant amount, enough amount. Since the sample mean in this case is actually less than mu naught, we can instantly conclude that H naught is not rejected. And this is true as long as our alpha is not greater than 0 0.5, which would actually then put the T critical, even for a right tail test, it would put a T critical for a right tail test to the left of the middle, to the left of zero. In reality, we see that alpha common alpha values tend to be no larger than around 0 0.10, perhaps as high as maybe around 0 0.20, but certainly nowhere near 0 0.50. So we can apply this rule then. And the reverse is true for a left tail test. We would likewise not reject H0 if the sample mean obtained was greater than mu0. In general, for any one tail test with a sample statistic on the other side of the hypothesized value than the tail, the correct decision is to not reject H0. As with claims about population means, Hypothesis tests can be used to make decisions regarding claims about population proportions. The overall process is similar to that for tests about population means, with the following distinctions. Firstly, as with confidence intervals, the Z distribution can be used for hypothesis tests about population proportions. Therefore, the test statistic for such tests is Z, rather than T, as is the case for tests about population means. The use of the Z distribution is valid under the assumption that proportions are based upon independent binomial conditions using the general rule of thumb that NP and N times 1 minus P must both be greater than or equal to 5. The formula for Z obtained is based upon the corresponding confidence interval for a single population proportion, assuming that P equals P naught. And that formula is that Z obtained equals P bar minus P naught divided by the square root of P naught times one minus P naught over N. In example seven, a seed supplier states that its plum tomato seeds have a germination rate of 0 0.55. In part A, we test this claim using the critical value method at alpha equals 0.05 against a sample of 50 sowed seeds of which 36 germinate. In part B, we calculate the p-value corresponding to this obtained sample data and answer the question of what the result tells us about how the decision from part A might change with a different level of significance. So to answer this question, we start by calculating, we, we can calculate p-bar because we have that information now if we were actually conducting the experiment we wouldn't collect the sample data until after we had uh, selected our alpha, but we might as well proceed here uh, since we have the information. P bar would equal 36 out of 50, so that's 36 over 50, which equals 0.72. That's the sample proportion. Now, to answer part A, we have the claim. We start, step one is that the claim is that P equals 0.55. So this is not a directional claim. It's not saying that P is greater than or less than 0.55, just that it equals 0.55. So this is going to be a two-tailed test. So step two, we set up our hypotheses. H naught is that P equals 
0.55 and H A is that P is not equal to 0.55. Step three, we is we know that our alpha here is 0 0.05 because we've been instructed that way in part A. And in step four, we can set up our formula for Z obtained, which is going to be that Z obtained equals P bar minus 0.55 divided by the square root of 0.55 times 0.45 over 50. And again, we we are sort of pretending here that we don't know the value of p bar, although we've got it all calculated already. Uh, if you were conducting the experiment at this point, you wouldn't quite yet know p bar. Now you would go out and collect your data, and then you would have your p bar. In step five, we set up our decision rule. We have alpha equals 0 0.05 and a two-tailed test. So our Z critical is equal to plus or minus 1.960. In step six now, we go ahead as if we had just conducted the sampling and we substitute our uh, sample proportion value of 0.72 into the formula for Z obtained and we get a value of Z obtained equal to 2.416. We analyze that in step seven, we can see that this value lies in the right rejection region. So therefore we reject H naught, that P is equal to 0 0.55. And therefore we can say that the sample data supports H A, which is that P is not equal to 0 0.55. Finally, in step eight, in the context of the problem, we reject the seed suppliers claim that these seeds have a germination rate of 0 0.55. And we can also say Furthermore, based on these sample results, that there is significant evidence to suggest that the germination rate for these seeds exceeds 0 0.55, which presumably would be a good decision or good news for the seed supplier, meaning that the conclusion here is that the seed supplier's seeds have a better germination rate than 0 0.55. In part B, to get the p-value from Z obtained equals 2.416 for a two-tail test, we look up Z equals minus 2.42 in the table. Now we round to two decimal places because remember in the Z table, Z only goes to two decimal places. So we round 2.416 to 2.42. We, we use the negative value to get the left tail because that's how the table works. And then we multiply by two because there's also a right tail with the same area. So therefore, the P value equals two times the phi value for minus 2.42, which gives us two times 0 0.0078 or 0 0.0156. So therefore, for alpha equals to 0 0.05 and 0 0.10 and greater values of alpha, we would reject H naught and therefore reject the claim. And for alpha equal to 0 0.01 and lesser common values of alpha, we would not reject H naught. In example eight, a competitor seed supplier argues that the plum tomato seeds from the company in example seven actually have a germination rate less than 0 0.5. In part A, we test this claim using the critical value method at alpha equals 0 0.01 against a sample of 100 sowed seeds of which 46 germinate. And in part B, we calculate the p-value corresponding with this sample result and comment on what this tells us about decision-making across common values of alpha. So to answer this problem, we start again by calculating p-bar because we have the summary information and it equals 46 out of 100, which is 0 0.46. And then we, to answer part A, we proceed uh, as if we were conducting the experiment. We start in step one with the claim that p is less than 0 0.5. Now this makes it, that makes this a, it's directional. So that makes this a one tail left tail test. And so in step two, we can set up our hypotheses. Our HA is the claim, which is that P is less than 0 0.5, and H naught, therefore, is that P is greater or equal to 0 0.5. Step three, we have alpha equals 0 0.01. Step four, our Z obtained equals P bar minus 0 0.5 divided by the square root of 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 divided by 100. 
In step five, we set up our decision rule. We have alpha equals 0 0.01 and a one-tailed left tail test. So Z critical is equal to minus 2.326. Step six, we substitute our sample result, our uh, P bar value of 0.46 into the equation for Z obtained and we get an answer of minus 0.800. In step seven, we analyze this result and we see that Z obtained lies in the non-rejection region. It does, it does lie to the left of zero, but not far enough to be in the rejection region. So therefore, we do not reject H naught that P is greater or equal to 0 0.5. And then in step eight, we put that into finally into the context of the problem. We therefore reject the competitor's claim that their rival seeds rival seeds have a germination rate less than 0 0.5. In part B, we take the value of Z obtained and we round to two decimal places. So we get minus 0 0.80 and we find the course, the P value that corresponds to that is equal to the phi value for minus 0 0.80, which we get from the table and equals 0 0.2119. Now that P value is greater than alpha for all common alpha values, as it's actually larger than 0.2. So therefore, we would generally not reject the null hypothesis, H naught, that P is greater or equal to 0 0.5. And thus, we would generally reject the competitor's claim that their rival seeds have a germination rate less than 0 0.5. I hope that you found this video helpful. If you liked it and would like to see more from Ursa Campus, then please subscribe. And also, if you'd like to send your feedback, that's always welcome too. Thanks for watching, and I wish you well with your studies.